Aloha everyone and welcome back to Human Nutrition here at Chaminade University. Today we will be delving into Unit 14, which discusses the life cycle nutrition of individuals who are pregnant. So it'll be pregnancy nutrition through early infancy. We'll be discussing the multiple stages of pregnancy and different key time frames which pose risks to fetal development. And we'll talk about how dietary and lifestyle factors can be associated with a successful or an unsuccessful pregnancy. Talk about different key nutrient needs for women who are pregnant and the different time frames. So we'll talk about the nutrient needs for them at the first, second, and third trimester of pregnancy. And we'll talk about special concerns for much younger or much older or low income mothers to be. We'll talk about the benefits of breastfeeding and then also the benefits of infant formula as a healthy alternative. Um, talking about the nutritional needs of infants, basically whether it's breast milk or whether it's infant milk or infant formula, it's going to have to meet the nutritional needs of the infant. Um, and then we'll talk about when you should introduce solid foods to the infants and which solid foods you should introduce. And last but not least, we'll talk about allergens, food allergens, and how that can cause a life-threatening reaction, an allergic reaction in a, a young child or in a pregnant woman. So obviously the goal for a healthy pregnancy is to support the health of both the woman and her growing baby. And that means that the diet has to meet the nutritional demands of pregnancy and also infant development. Now a normal pregnancy lasts 39 to 40 weeks from conception to birth and is divided into three trimesters which are 13 weeks long. Um, additionally, we separate the prenatal development into two major periods. The first period is considered to be embryonic, and the second period is considered to be fetal. Um, so this is a depiction of the different stages of development of an infant, and when it is called a fetus versus an embryo. So here, this is the initial stage of fertilization. This is the zygote. The zygote is going to undergo multiple division events while it's still considered a pre-embryo. That's in the first two weeks. After that two weeks, it has implanted into the uterus. So for the first two weeks, it's actually going to be traveling through the fallopian tubes and finding a nice place to settle in for implantation. When implantation occurs, now it's considered an embryo. That's for weeks three to eight. Um, and then after this, we're going to start having placental development occurring right around week six to eight. Um, then the second trimester is going to start around week 13. At this point forward, we will be calling it a fetus. Um, and then we'll enter into the third trimester, which is going to be just prior to delivery. Now, nutrients are going to get to the embryo and waste are going to be pulled away from the embryo. Um, through the placenta. So the placenta is a temporary organ. So it's very interesting because it actually is an organ, of the, it's a maternal organ that's going to allow interaction with the fetal blood supply, but not directly. So the fetal blood supply and the maternal blood supply are going to interact in this specialty organ, which is going to allow certain things across, but not everything. So red blood cells, bacteria, large proteins are not going to be able to get from the mother to the fetus. But other substances, such as alcohol, which is why we want to make sure that we are not drinking or using any drugs during pregnancy, um, these can all cross through the placenta. Additionally, the placenta is going to be responsible for hormonal release. So it's going to release hormones that are required to support the changes that are going to occur physiologically during pregnancy. So again, the placenta is a very, um, it's a temporary organ that has very unique characteristics. Here's the uterine lining with the maternal blood vessels. Those maternal blood vessels are going to basically secrete or seep blood into the placental organ. And then the fetal blood vessels are going to be juxtaposed to this pool of maternal blood, which is going to allow things to diffuse across from the maternal blood supply into the fetal blood supply. Again, not everything is going to make it across, but small molecules like nutrients are going to go across as well as oxygen and carbon dioxide out. So this is how we're going to basically be providing all of the nutrients to the developing um, embryo or fetus and how we are then going to be getting back um, all of the waste that is going to be secreted from this new organism. So we have major critical periods during fetal development. So there's specialty stages during which normal growth and division is going to allow for the differentiation of particular body structures. Oftentimes these critical periods are going to be in that first trimester. A lot of things are occurring um, during that first trimester. And that means that in this critical time frame, we have a high vulnerability for things like nutritional deficits, toxins, other harmful factors, and unfortunately, something that can um, cause harm during this time frame is typically going to be irreversible. So it's going to be very difficult to just restore the nutrient needs and get back um, what we need in terms of normal fetal development. 
Oftentimes, um, things like famine, so a shortage of food, is going to be associated with heart disease. If we have low amounts of iron, for example, that can be associated with poor cognitive development. And again, we're not just going to be able to introduce iron when they are um, when they are born, right? If we have a lack of something that causes a mal uh, a mal nutritive state, this is going to have long-term effects for the individual. So this here shows the major stages of prenatal development that are what are considered critical windows. Um, and the critical windows are going to be times when we are differentiating and developing different body systems, such as the central nervous system, the heart, upper limbs, eyes, lower limbs, teeth, palate, etc. So these are all different critical windows for these major different differentiation pathways, whereby things like a teratogen, which is a word you might not have heard before, but that basically just means a mutagen that's going to cause issues with the development of a fetus, so it won't cause issues with an already developed individual, but it may cause serious issues during embryonic differentiation and development. And so if a teratogen is able to affect an individual, this is going to be the red window, it's going to be the window where that embryo is going to be highly susceptible. Um, and remember that embryonic window is going to stop around week eight, right around when the placenta takes over, and then starting going forward, that's going to be considered fetal period. So as soon as we are going to be relying on the placenta for exchange, that's then going to be called a fetus. And each of these have a high window of, of overlap, namely between the three to eight week range. Um, oftentimes, individuals who are going to have congenital defects or anomalies that are um, going to be associated with these regions often will cause a fetal loss event in the early stages. Typically, a woman doesn't even know that she's pregnant in these early stages. She typically learns she's pregnant around week six to eight. Um, so some things that can occur if an individual is um, undergoing famine conditions during gestation, we can have issues that occur at the first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester. One of the major ones that can occur is glucose intolerance, um, and that means that you're not able to have a typical response to ingestion of glucose. That means you're having a hard time regulating your blood glucose levels, um, and this is why oftentimes um, individuals are supposed to take a glucose test to identify pre diabetic conditions where they have to chug a certain amount of glucose, so you drink a glucose solution and then they do a blood draw um, immediately and then either one hour or three hours after to see how well your blood glucose levels are associated, making sure that you're not diabetic or pre-diabetic conditions. But some other things that can occur, particularly in the first trimester, can be something like coronary heart disorder, um, stress sensitivity, etc. So that means that mothers need to make sure that they're adopting a healthy lifestyle. And this actually occurs before conception. You want to maintain a healthy weight beforehand and maintain a healthy weight throughout the pregnancy because if we have obese conditions or overweight conditions, which are far more likely to occur here in the United States than, say, malnutrition, um, these are going to be associated or can be associated with complications in pregnancy or infertility in general. Um, it can also be associated with birth defects and difficult deliveries. And children that are born to obese or overweight mothers are more likely to develop childhood obesity and diabetes and hypertension, etc. later in life. However, the flip side of the coin is that individuals who are underweight are at risk for delivering babies who have low birth weights or small for gestational age babies. And that means that these individuals, these children, might be at a higher risk for developing lung disease and also a high risk of death in that first year of life. So some of the things that mothers can do in order to make sure that they've adopted a healthy lifestyle and a healthy diet during pregnancy is to make sure that they consume adequate amounts of folic acid. This is actually something that's found in every prenatal. Um, it fo folic acid deficiency is associated with neural tube defects, namely spina bifida. Um, and so we want to make sure that we get enough folic acid, approximately 400 micrograms daily, to make sure that we can synthesize all of the cells necessary for a complete neural tube formation. We also want to make sure that we're eating fish, but remember there's a, a certain types of fish are higher or lower in levels of methylmercury, so you want to make sure that you're eating fish that are low levels of methylmercury, which means you have to limit canned tuna to no more than six ounces weekly. Um, additionally, you want to limit your caffeine to less than 150 milligrams per day, which is about a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee is about 90, so that's about a cup of coffee and a half, so it doesn't mean you have to entirely eliminate caffeine, but you do want to make sure you have lower amounts of caffeine, particularly, and I'm going to go backwards here, particularly during this time frame of heart development. High levels of caffeine can cause a, an embryonic heart to race, and it's already beating at 150 beats per minute, which is about double what we normally are going to have. So if we increase that heart rate even further, we can cause heart defects as the heart is not entirely formed during this time frame and truly can't always handle the stress. So that's one of the major th problems with caffeine, but caffeine can also um, just have issues with um, 
not just heart development, but also increase the risk of miscarriage. So again, limiting caffeine is going to be important. They want to completely avoid certain things. I know that you probably shouldn't even have to say this, but you shouldn't be smoking during pregnancy, drinking alcohol, or taking any illicit drugs. Why? Because smoking is associated with a whole risk of birth defects, including, well, subfertility or infertility, or babies that are born at low birth rates, or have stunted growth, um, or mental impairments. And it's also drastically linked to what's called SIDS, or Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, which is an inexplicable infant death that typically occurs while they're sleeping and simply fail to take the next breath. Um, oftentimes, individuals that are at risk for sudden infant death syndrome will be sent home with monitors for their breathing so that they can have a little beepy beepy that will go off when they stop breathing and mothers who are can run over to the crib and um, awake the infant, which will typically restart the breathing process. Um, alcohol is obviously a no-no, as are illicit drugs. Anything that can cross into the um, fetal blood supply is going to be very bad for the fetus. So um, any toxin that can cross, I apologize, into the fetal blood supply will be bad for the fetus. And alcohol is one of those toxins that can cross into the blood supply. And so pregnant women are advised to abstain completely from alcohol because we just don't know exactly where. We know that small amounts are going to be tolerated, but we don't know exactly where that toxic, toxic level falls. So you want to make sure that you're um, entirely eliminating alcohol from your diet. And then, of course, you want to eliminate illicit drugs because they can cause miscarriage, birth defects, and low birth weight. Now, the mother is going to incur some pretty intense physiological changes as they go through the first, second, and third trimester. In the first trimester, the mother may reckon, um, recognize that her breasts are very tender. They might be enlarged or engorged. Um, she might have a heightened sense of taste or smell. Um, typically, this is going to be for negative smells. So she might be um, have aversions to particular smells, like a for example, a hand soap or something that she used to have no problem with, she no longer can stand. Um, also, the food cravings are going to be pretty intense. And also, food aversions can occur. Um, and we're not really sure exactly why, because the cravings you would think might be indicating that the mother is missing the nutrients, but scientific evidence actually refutes that theory. So um, we're not sure exactly why, but women have random cravings for particular foods, which tend to seem pretty odd to other people, pickle and peanut butter sandwiches, for example. Um, and sometimes something can occur called pica. This also happens in small children and in people who have, sometimes have a disorder. But pica is basically when you're craving a something that is a non-food, things like laundry starch or matches um, or clay, dirt, etc. And typically, this is associated with anemia. This is something that's associated with low blood levels of iron. And if you're not quite sure why, um, what you're missing, your body is craving it, it might know, oh, there's iron in that dirt. And so you'll start craving these very odd things, which may have low levels of the minerals that the mother is craving, um, but can also cause serious issues, like obviously eating paint chips is not going to be good for the fetus. Some other physiological changes that occur in the female include morning sickness. Although it's called morning sickness, it can occur all day long, sometimes in the middle of the night. And it's typically associated with that heightened sense of smell. So as I mentioned, there are aversions. And if you smell something that you're averse to, that can cause you to um, trigger nausea or vomiting. Another thing that typically will cause this is brushing your teeth because it kind of tr triggers that gag reflex. Um, so something that mothers can do to help alleviate the symptoms it can include eating small meals instead of large meals, um, and frequently, particularly meals that are high in carbohydrates, to be able to give you um, give you that energy source. Also, sometimes salty foods or sour or tart beverages can help alleviate the symptoms. Things like ginger can help reduce the nausea symptoms and vitamin B6 as well. Um, and if we have serious issues of morning sickness, you can end up with severe weight loss and dehydration and electrolyte imbalances, um, none of which are good for the fetus. So obviously you want to try to see a doctor if you are getting into severe cases of morning sickness. Um, they might even hospitalize you and give you a feeding, um, a feeding tube or something like that. So here's a table of the recommended weight gain that you're supposed to be gaining during pregnancy. And the weight gain is actually going to vary depending on your pre-pregnancy body mass. So if your pre-pregnancy body mass is already in the obese range, these individuals that are at 30, then your recommended weight gain is actually fairly low. You're expected to gain between 11 to 20 pounds, which isn't really all that much compared to individuals that have a pre-pregnancy body mass of lower than 18.5, so very skinny individuals or underweight individuals, they might be gaining upwards of 40 pounds. Now, in a normal average healthy woman, 
you should be gaining about 30 pounds during pregnancy. Um, and a lot of this is water weight gain. So the fetus is only going to comprise about a third of the total weight gain. The rest is going to be all maternal tissues. Remember, you have a brand new organ that's just been created called the placenta, and that's going to be filled with a lot more blood. You've also increased your blood supply. Eventually, you're going to get to 1.6 times the volume of a normal, healthy adult. Um, and so you should be gaining this weight. However, you should be gaining it pretty slowly. And at the very early stages in that first trimester, you should only be gaining about two pounds. Um, However, as I mentioned, if you have a healthy, normal BMI, you should be gaining a total of about 25 to 30 pounds during pregnancy. So the first trimester, you should be gaining just a couple of pounds. But by the second and third trimester, again, you'll be up to about 30 pounds of weight gain. And that's going to include um, an increase in your blood supply. As I mentioned, that's about four pounds just right there. The fetus itself is going to be, what, seven to nine pounds. And the placenta is going to be equivalent of that. The placenta, amniotic fluid, and all the other fluids associated with it are going to be about eight pounds too. So literally just upon delivery, you're going to lose 15 pounds plus any blood that you may lose. Um, and additionally, we are going to increase our maternal fat stores. So we're going to add about seven pounds of maternal fat. Don't worry, you're going to burn it off with breastfeeding chasing after that infant. Um, and then the uterus and your breasts are actually going to increase as well. You're going to gain about four pounds there. And then again, as I mentioned, overall, you're going to increase your blood supply by about three to four pounds as well. All right. So this is what the patterns of weight gain that you would see in a, individuals that are overweight, underweight, um, and normal weight pre-pregnancy. So if you were underweight pre-pregnancy, you're going to be gaining more than individuals that are normal weight pre-pregnancy who are going to be gaining more than individuals who are overweight pre-pregnancy. If you already start out at overweight conditions, you're only going to be gaining about 18 pounds throughout your pregnancy. Um, and as you notice, most of that is going to be the fetus, placenta, and other associated fluids. So really, when you're increasing all of these things as well, you actually are going to be decreasing the amount of pre-pregnancy weight, right? You're gaining less pounds pounds overall than the weights of all of these items here, including the increase in blood, fetus, and placental tissue. So what means we have to meet dietary considerations that are going to be a little bit different than your normal, um, your normal food intake? going to have an increase of over 50% for things like folate, remember that's folic acid, zinc, iron, and calcium. And that means that you're going to need to take a prenatal supplement because it's almost impossible to be able to consume enough folate-rich foods to get your 400 to 600 micrograms daily. Um, so 400 is your minimum, but typically they ask you to take 600 just to make sure that you are meeting the needs of your body. Um, additionally, with your um, individuals who are have anemic or pre-anemic conditions, they might need to take iron. Iron is going to help prevent anemia and is a very essential for the growth of the placenta and essential for fetal growth and development. However, it does run the side effect of um, sometimes causing constipation in individuals who take too high of a level of it. Um, typically, it's going to be a pill that you can take, but there's also liquid supplements that you can add um, to whatever it is that you're drinking for that day. Um, we also need to increase, as I mentioned, zinc and copper and calcium. So um, iron is going to help inhibit the absorption of zinc and copper. And if you're taking more iron, that means that with the normal levels of zinc and copper, you're not going to absorb as much as you need. So what that means is that you're going to have to increase the amount that comes in in order to be able to meet your needs because you're going to have an inhibition of absorption. We also need calcium and vitamin D and in high amounts. Why? Because we're creating fetal bones. And if we don't put calcium into the mother's diet, then the calcium is going to be drawn from the mother's bones. In fact, there's an old expression, one tooth per pregnancy or one tooth per child, um, which we no longer have happen here in first world nations. But in third world nations where um, pregnancy nutrition isn't something that's adequately taken into consideration, oftentimes the calcium that is um, going to be used to create the fetal bones is going to come directly from the mother, which can cause low bone mass in the mother and osteoporotic conditions. Obviously, you want to avoid that by adding exogenous calcium to the diet of this individual. Um, and if the mother is vegetarian or vegan, there are other nutrients that they have to take into consideration, such as the concentration of omega-3 fatty acids, choline, vitamin 2, etc. I'm sorry, vitamin B12, I apologize, in the, um, in the, the mother. However, there are some nutrients that can be toxic if you overconsume them. So you want to make sure that you're getting adequate but not excessive amounts of vitamin A and vitamin D as these can lead to toxicity. This is a myplate.gov, right, that tells you what the nutrient needs are for individuals during pregnant. So here's the recommended DRI for non-pregnant women, and here's the recommended nutrient intake for um, pregnant women. As, as you can see, most of these are going to go up dramatically from the, um, the pre-pregnancy conditions. Last but not least, pregnant women are told to avo avoid certain types of food. 
And that's not for the fetus, that's for the health of the mother, as the mother is actually going to have an compromised immune system. And that's because the fetus is considered non-self. And remember, there's always a battle within your body between self and non-self. That's what your immune system's job is, to identify non-self and kill it. But we won't want to do that to a, a fetus. So the immune system of a woman who is pregnant has been compromised. And that means that they're unable to fight off certain bacterial infections, etc., which means they should avoid anything that might introduce bacteria into their diet. Things like undercooked meats or raw fish or poultry, things like unpasteurized milk, cheese and juices, or raw sprouts. Basically, any time that they could be introduced to something like E. coli um, or some sort of listeria, some sort of bacterial contamination that a normal body would be able to fight right off, a pregnant woman's body is much more susceptible to foodborne illness. So that means that individuals who are pregnant need to take great care in their diets, that they're avoiding things that might introduce bacteria, soft cheeses, etc., um, or that they are, um, for example, microwaving the, uh, the lunch meats before they make their sandwich to make sure that they completely annihilate any bacteria that might be present if they're breaking these rules. All right, so let's talk about the second trimester. In the second trimester, we need an additional 350 kilocalories a day, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually is going to be um, something that causes women to wake up in the middle of the night starving sometimes. So you want to make sure that you're consuming adequate amounts of your cake house, particularly cake house coming from carbohydrates and proteins, as we're going to need a minimum of about 175 grams of carbs. And your protein needs are going to increase to about 71 grams. That's an increase of about 35%. So that means you should be eating things that are going to be really high or nutrient dense, things like peanut butter, etc., that can help you get those additional cake house in so you're not waking up in the middle of the night um, and rummaging through the fridge. Um, lastly, you want to make sure that you are getting enough exercise. And I know that people who are in their second, first and second trimester often have what's called lethargy or feelings of complete fatigue, which means that the exercise can actually be difficult to work in because just walking up the steps can sometimes feel like it's exhausting. But you want to make sure that you get enough exercise, at least 30 minutes every day, such that we can make sure that we're keeping our metabolism up, which will help us um, in terms of making sure that our body is running smoothly. So you want to make sure that you're doing safe activities. You want, don't want to do things that are high impact. You want to make sure you're walking or cycling or swimming, right? Um, things that are considered safe. Now, things that are contact sports and high impact activities are considered unsafe, like field hockey, for example. You should avoid that or horseback riding because you might get thrown and, and impact might end up injuring you. Um, same as certain things like racquetball sports, like tennis and racquetball or whatnot, it's the crossing over of your arms and the twisting can actually cause contortion or torsion inside the pregnancy, which can cause issues um, and, and with both the mother and fetal health. So you want to make sure that you are exercising, but you're doing it in a moderate to, to safe um, way. All right, so previously I talked about sugar tolerance or glucose tolerance and how women needed to make sure that they were um, checking that they weren't having gestational diabetes or pre-diabetic conditions. Now, the onset of gestational diabetes occurs approximately at the 20-week mark, um, and what happens is she has difficulties regulating her own blood glucose levels during pregnancy, and it's a typical type of um, diabetes that only occurs during gestation, but if it happened during your previous pregnancy, we now know that you're at risk for your next pregnancy, or if it happened to your mother, or your sisters and you have a uh, hereditary risk, then it's something that you want to monitor more closely. It can cause something called macrosomia. Um, it also causes an increased risk of jaundice and breathing problems for the um, and, and birth defects for the infant. And also causes an increased risk for hypoglycemia or low um, sugar levels after birth. So again, this is what I was talking about when I said individuals would have to fast and then chug a glucose drink and then take blood panels both um, at the time of or just before drinking and then that one hour or three hour mark just to make sure that gluto glucose metabolism is functioning properly. So some risk factors for gestational diabetes include your age and your weight. So being in the overweight category is going to increase your risk as well as being over 25 years old, as well as having any history, either your own history of a higher normal or your family history of higher than normal blood glucose levels. And there are certain genetic backgrounds, such as being Hispanic or Pacific Islander or African American, Native American, that increase the risk factors for gestational diabetes. Um, other risk factors include having given birth to a very large baby or having had multiple or a stillborn or multiple stillborn events or again having had gestational diabetes during previous pregnancies all of these are risk factors which means that those individuals have to be tested more often or more rigorously other things that can occur 
include pregnancy-induced hypertension or high blood pressure that occurs during pregnancy. And we can have three major stages of this. One is gestational hypertension, which is when an individual who has no previous history of hypertension gets hypertension early in the pregnancy. Um, and if this becomes severe, we can have preeclamptic conditions. Now, preeclamptic and eclamptic conditions can cause serious problems, and so these are going to need to be monitored. If it, if it, an individual who is suffering from preeclampsia might actually be induced to have an early delivery um, and not make it to the 40-week mark. Absolutely, an individual who is suffering from eclampsia will be told um, to enter into labor immediately. Um, and that's because preeclampsia and eclampsia conditions can cause serious problems both to the mother and to the fetus. Preeclampsia is defined as hypertension or high blood pre pressure, severe edema, which means that you're going to have swollen feet, swollen hands, and your protein is going to be lost in the urine. All of these are going to be pretty bad for the individual. But on top of that, it's compounded because the fetus is going to be deprived of oxygen and nutrient-rich blood from the placenta. That means that the fetus is entering into oxygen starvation, which is obviously very bad, and the mother is also entering into um, dangerous conditions. So preeclamptic and eclamptic conditions are typically going to be a cause for a, um, an early delivery. Because the only way to stop this preeclamptic is kind of a feed-forward cycle is actually to deliver the baby. So if we end up in eclampsia conditions, this might be an immediate, um, immediate delivery. All right, in the third trimester, you want to make sure you're getting an extra 450 kcals per day. Um, sometimes mothers can experience heartburn because of pressure that's pu pushing on the intestines and stomach, which might cause... Um, the gastric juices or gastroesophageal um, reflex to occur, so the gastric juices can come up into the esophagus. To avoid this, um, women are told to avoid lying down during eating or after eating because this is going to be a time frame when the stomach acid can seep out and into your, um, into your esophagus. You want to make sure that you've got gravity on your side here. Additionally, you want to eat smaller meals more frequently as opposed to large meals less frequently. And avoid anything that's spicy or highly, highly seasoned because that can cause an increase in the, um, in the secretion of hydrochloric acid acid, which can then cause an uh, increase in gastroesophageal reflux. Also, um, women can experience constipation because the hormonal changes that they're encountering can cause the food to move more slowly through their gastrointestinal tract. Um, and one of the main ways that we can go ahead and, and combat this is with increased exercise, which can help move things around, and also consuming more fiber in our diet, which can help move things along. All right, so let's talk about special concerns that young women, old women, and low-income women face. Now, teenage mothers face their own subset of nutritional challenges because they and themselves have not necessarily finished development. So if they are still growing, I mean, a woman can get as pregnant as early as 11, right, almost immediately after our first menstrual cycle. In fact, the earliest delivery on record, I believe, is six in Peru. Um, and so an individual that is younger is going to end up at a nutritional deficit more easily Additionally, their diet is very likely to be unbalanced as opposed to an older woman who might have a little bit more prenatal knowledge um, and that they're more likely to um, suffer from eating disorders, for example, or to be eating things that are a little bit less healthy, like a diet that's going to be high in fast food. Um, they also tend to be low in certain um, micronutrients like iron, folic acid, calcium, and sometimes also kilocalories as well. Remember if they're dieting, etc. And that means that they typically have a higher risk of an inadequate diet than a mother who is in her 20s. And that means that that inadequate diet can lead to several things, including lower birth weight or a compromised growth or health of the mother. Older mothers also face special concerns. Mothers that are 35 years old or older can face increased um, risk of infertility, so a difficulty conceiving. They also are at higher risk for gestational diabetes and pregnancy-induced hypertension or high blood pressure, even if they don't have a history of that previously. And um, the maternal aging effect means that they are more likely to have babies that are born with meiotic conditions, such as a Down syndrome or trisomy 21 or other developmental disabilities. So um, a, an elderly mother, which again, 35, I know doesn't seem elderly, but 35 to 45 is considered an elderly mother. Um, and she is going to be more likely to have developmental disabilities, so we're more likely to be running in a full panel to make sure that we can eliminate some of the developmental disabilities or um, things like Down syndrome. Maybe not eliminate the fetus because this is going to be up to the woman to make that decision, but at least she has the factors in her hand to be able to make that decision and isn't going to be surprised by a baby that has some sort of developmental disorder. Um, this means that older mothers want to make sure that they have gotten their diet and their nutritional needs in order before pregnancy, making sure that they have a healthy body weight, they've 
um, have undergone secession of smoking and have um, eating chosen to eat a more balanced or nutri uh, nutritional diet. Now, there's several different things that can negatively affect a pregnancy. So factors that include lifestyle factors or your age factors, as I mentioned, being under 20 or over age 35, um, your weight pre-pregnancy, whether you're underweight or obese, or if you're not gaining um, weight or you're gaining too much weight during pregnancy, um, the health of the mother, the diet of the mother, which is what we've been focusing on for the for this lecture, but also the so socioeconomic status, right? A woman who's impoverished is less likely to be able to afford, say, prenatal vitamins or prenatal care or might have food scarcity um, and also might have a lower education level, which ties into um, being uninformed in terms of what she should be eating throughout her pregnancy. So anyone that is going to um, have lifestyle factors or be really young or really old, or really obese or really underweight or suffer from chronic diseases or have poverty conditions. These are all individuals that are um, going to need more assistance during pregnancy and really could stand to see a nutritionist or at least make sure that they're checking in with their doctor that, to make sure that they're meeting their nutritional needs. Um, we have specialty programs in place for those low-income mothers that I was just talking about. Low-income mothers often need food assistance, not just for themselves, but also for their infant and child once the child is born. So we have specialty nutritional programs for women, infants, and children, and this is called the WIC program. And that is going to ensure that the general population is going to be creating babies that are born with a lower percentage chance of birth defects. That means that low-income pregnant women and postpartum women are going to have access to the nutritional information and the diet that they need in order to be able to um, avoid the nutritional deficits that can cause birth defects. So we want to make sure that they're able to have access to their supplemental foods, such as infant formula, right? Iron-fortified infant formula, cereal, iron-fortified adult cereal for the mother, um, vitamin C-rich fruit or vegetable juice, um, eggs, milk, cheese, peanut butter, etc. All of these are going to be things that allow um, for healthy growth of the fetus and also of the infant. And it's funny because people who are opposed to social welfare programs often talk about the drain on society and how expensive it is that we're funding these programs. But actually, these programs save us money because every dollar that we spend on the Women, Infant, and Children program actually saves us in healthcare costs approximately two to three dollars in healthcare costs in the first 60 days after birth. So it pays for itself almost immediately. Within two months, that is going to end up to a savings to the American public. So these programs are actually going to be very beneficial, not only for the mothers and the infants who are suffering from um, low income problems, but also for the general public at whole, as a whole, because that's going to save the medical care costs, which would then fall to the burden of the taxpayer. All right, so now we're going to talk about lactation and breastfeeding. So lactation is the process of producing milk in a woman's body, and the suckling is the actual act of pulling the milk out of the mother's breast. That stimulates milk production as well as um, there's some hormones involved here called prolactin, which also stimulates milk production, and oxytocin, which is known as the love hormone. This allows you to bind both with your partner postcoital and also with your infant during, um, during breastfeeding. And this results in what's called the letdown response. So when you have the oxytocin surge through you, the milk that has been stored, it's been created by the increase in prolactin, is going to be stored in the breast tissue and then it's going to be released when that infant starts suckling. What's really awesome about breastfeeding is that the milk that the mother provides is actually going to change based on the infant's needs. Um, and that means that an infant that is sick, for example, is going to get different conditions than an infant that is in good health. And an infant that is lacking in a particular substance, somehow the mother is aware um, of what is lacking in the infant's diet and provides that to her infant in an easily digestible form. So breast milk actually changes every day. However, infant formula obviously is a little bit more stable. So um, an individual who might be suffering from malnutrition or a mother who is having inadequate milk supply should not be faulting herself for supplementing with formula. Because formula, even if you are entirely breastfeeding, a glass of formula or a bottle of formula every now and again, make sure that the infant is meeting the nutritional or is getting its nutritional needs met because formula is supplemented and makes sure that it's providing all of the nutrients that an infant needs. So this here is showing you the letdown response. So the suckling stimulus is going to send information to the mother's hypothalamus and then that hypothalamus is going to release prolactin which is going to cause 
lactation, right, the creation of milk. And then oxytocin is going to trigger the letdown response. All right, so as I mentioned, the nutritional composition of breast milk changes as the infant grows. So the very first type of milk that's created is actually going to be a very low amounts of concentration. So they're only going to be making um, small amounts. The infant's um, stomach is very, very small. However, colostrum, which is that very early breast milk, is going to have um, it's going to have low fat, but much higher in protein, vitamin A, minerals, and immune factors that the infant is going to need just post birth. And then approximately four to seven days after built, um, after birth, colostrum is going to switch to breast milk. Breast milk is going to have lactose, fat, and B vitamins. And it's going to be lower in certain fat-soluble vitamins, sodium, and other minerals than it was previously. Breast milk helps protect the, um, the newborn against infections, allergies, and different diseases. It helps decrease the risk of diarrhea and other intestinal disorders because you're passing on immunity to your baby, which can help offset an infection, which could cause us diarrhea. Also, same thing with respiratory and ear infections, right? You're passing on an immune system, so the immune system of the infant is increasing. Also going to help stave off a lot of infections like meningitis, which is an infection in the meninges in the spinal column or urinary tract infections. And it does that because it helps ward off bacterial infections, viral infections, fungal infections, and inflammatory responses. It it also helps provide things like antioxidants, enzyme, hormones, and growth factors, all of which are going to be very beneficial for that newborn infant. Breastfeeding actually is going to help um, reduce the risk for childhood obesity. So if infants are going to get breast milk past the six-month mark, somehow that helps reset their um, risk for childhood obesity. We also know that breast milk is going to be really important for brain development. It has DHA and arachidonic acid in it. Just to be clear, so does infant formula. So infant formula is going to also have DHA and arachidonic acid in it. Both of these are very important for brain development, central nervous system development, also for vision, so the development of normal vision. Remember, infants are going to be um, born unable to focus, so although they can see, they aren't really getting much information from their visual field. They do end up getting the ability to focus shortly thereafter. Um, and so we want to make sure that they have the ability to learn to focus. And also, breastfed infants have pretty good cognitive function. All of these are going to lead to the idea that breast is best, right? However, there are individuals who are not creating enough milk or their milk is just simply not meeting the nutritional demands of the infant. So you have to make sure that you are having the weight of the infant checked. You're going to your normal healthy checkups just to make sure that you're not depriving the infant of nutrients when you think you're doing a good job because you're breastfeeding. All right, women who are breastfeeding have special nutrient lifestyle needs. First and foremost, they need more fluid because they're making more fluid. So they need 13 cups of fluid. And they also are going to need to eat extra food. So we'll need an additional 500 kcals per day from the first six months and 400 kcals per day during the second six months. Now, that doesn't all have to come from additional food to the diet. A lot of this can come from the fat stores in the body, right? Then that means that women who are breastfeeding are also going to enjoy um, the additional benefit of weight loss more quickly. And you want to make sure that an individual who is lactating is going to have a well-balanced diet so they're meeting all of their nutritional needs. And any individual who's lactating who is um, a vegan is going to need to make sure they're taking in adequate uh, amounts of certain things like vitamin B12 and zinc, so they might need to have exogenous supplements. Now, additionally, we have lifestyle habits. And just like we were talking about things going across the fetal membrane, sometimes things that are found in the mother's body are transmitted through breast milk. This includes alcohol drugs, tobacco, and smoking. So individuals who are consuming alcohol, they perform a practice called pump and dump, where they are going to pump the milk out of their breast and dump that milk down the drain, making sure that the none of the alcoholic milk is going to make it into the infant. During that time frame, they'll either be supplementing from frozen milk that they've stored um, or with, um, with formula. You also want to make sure you're limiting your caffeine consumption and the methylmercury consumption because your breast milk is actually going to reflect your nutrients. So what you eat is what comes out and gets passed on to the infant. Um, and that means that sometimes you have children that are unable to um, unable to eat or digest certain things. So mothers might need to avoid something that's a offending food. So oftentimes dairy, for example, is a pretty high one. So if your child is lactose intolerant, you want to make sure that you are not eating any lactose. Um, so you want to avoid dairy yourself so that you don't pass on something that causes an allergic reaction or a strong response or in your child, something that is an offensive food to them. Now, not all women are able to breastfeed. So although breast is best, 
fed is best. And this can include women who um, have something like HIV, or um, HIV is the virus and AIDS is the actual disorder, or leukemia, or active tuberculosis, people who are receiving chemotherapy or radiation or are prescribed specific drugs. They're not going to be able to breastfeed because these compounds are going to get passed on to the infant. Um, additionally, infants that cannot metabolize lactose should be fed a specialty formula. So they shouldn't, uh, although sometimes the mother is able to um, remove the dairy from their diet, sometimes they're still going to be sending um, lactose in in their breast milk, and these infants are not going to be able to consume that breast milk, and so they should be um, they should be formula fed. And additionally, every single prescribed medication that a woman is taking should be cross referenced with either their doctor or their pharmacist to make sure that they are safe for the breast milk. And if they are not, they should be switching to formula. Now, as I mentioned, fed is best. So although breast milk does provide all of the needs for the infant, it changes, and it can change based on the diet of the individual, and that means that you might not always necessarily be meeting the nutrient needs of the infant. That means that even those individuals that are breastfeeding almost exclusively should occasionally supplement with a little bit of formula, just to make sure it's like giving them a multivitamin. Um, and formula is very well developed, right? We have spent decades developing formula that is similar as possible to breast milk. Typically, it's going to be made from cow's milk, um, but you want to make sure that you're not feeding infants the unmodified cow's milk as they're simply just going to be unable to digest a lot of the compounds in it, and it's also going to not have enough nutrients in it. So it will fill the baby's belly, but it won't meet the nutrient needs of the individual. Um, you want to make sure that you avoid giving infants with a bottle to sleep, sorry, putting infants to sleep with a bottle. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, infants don't always know when to stop nursing, which means that even though they might stop suckling, there might be a little bit of a drip, which can cause um, drowning, essentially. Um, but more likely, the problem is going to be bottle tooth decay, which means that we have sugary liquids out of the milk or whatnot, which can then cause tooth decay for an infant. You also want to make sure that you're um, making having a reduction in the sugary liquids because this can also lead to an increased um, ear infection risk, etc. All right, so this is just an overview of the different foods and milestones that a baby should be eating throughout the first year of life. Um, so from birth to three months old, they should be getting nothing additional, simply breast milk or formula and nothing else because they're only suckling at this point. They're not going to be able to digest um, heavy foods. As we end up in the three to six month mark, we can add in infant cereal, like infant oatmeal or, or um, rice powder, etc. However, this can sometimes cause constipation effects with the with the infant. So if infants aren't going to receive this very well, you can skip this stage and continue with iron fortified formula and breast milk up until the six month mark. Um, after that, we should be adding a little bit of strained vegetables and fruits. Obviously, you're still going to be adding formula all the way up to the one year mark. But we're going to add in things like um, diluted fruit juice, or strained vegetables and fruit, et cetera. Around the six to nine month, we can start adding in plain yogurt, pureed meat, pureed beans. Um, and then the nine to 12 month mark, this baby's gonna be able to eat almost everything that's provided in a family meal. So just let them eat whatever they choose to eat in terms of chopping them up and letting them kind of play with the finger foods, but you're still going to be giving them breast milk and formula up until at least the one year mark. Some people can no, will breastfeed up until the two or three year mark particularly in third world nations where food might be scarce. Here's some of the milestones for the infant, when they should be starting to suckle, when they can move their head, when they're able to sit with support, when they're able to chew, grasp things in their hand, and finally feed themselves. So by the one year mark, they should be picking up food off of the table, just finger foods, and putting it into their mouth on their own. This also, incidentally, is going to be the time frame when children are going to want to put all sorts of things in their mouth, such as marbles and pennies, etc. So you want to make sure that everything that is around is going to have anything that's a choking hazard removed. All right, so infants also have specialty cacao, iron, and other nutrient needs. They have specialty energy needs, carbohydrate needs, protein needs, etc. In fact, they are going to have an unlimited amount of fat. Do not limit any fat from the infants. The infants are going to be putting on a lot of fat during this time frame. Um, and that's because they're going to be undergoing such a growth spurt in these first couple of months that they're going to be un consuming a whole bunch of energy, over 108 kcal per kilogram a day. They require supplements usually, so oftentimes we'll get injections, vitamin K injections, and very typically they also send you home from the hospital with um, vitamin D drops. 
And you can start taking those pretty early on, around two months of age. They also will send you um, home with iron-fortified foods, like infant cereal. You might get that from your doctor's office, but you can also obviously get that at the supermarket. And around six months of age, you should be introducing this into the infant's diet. Again, the diet should still be comprised almost entirely of breast milk or formula, but you want to make sure that you're adding in a couple of things as you go. Now, if a mother is entirely vegan and breastfeeding, they want to make sure that they're supplementing um, the infant's diet with vitamin B12 because, again, that's something that you typically are going to be getting from animal products. Um, and as I mentioned, you're not going to give them very much water at all. Limit your extra fluids and give... Um, 100% juice in moderation, but you want to mainly make sure that you're meeting their needs with breast milk or formula because if you end up giving them too much water, you can end up with an issue with the hyponatremia or low salt concentration in the body, which can be bad. So you want to make sure that you're meeting their needs with things that have electrolytes and fat in them like breast milk or formula. And if you are giving juices, 100% fruit juice is just too high in sugar. So you want to dilute it down to about 50% fruit juice. And again, even that is going to be in moderation because you want to make sure that your sodium balances are um, going to stay in homeostatic conditions. All right, breast milk and formula, again, that's the primary food source up until the one-year mark, although you are introducing solid foods around six to eight months. Um, when we are introducing foods, you want to make sure that you're watching for signs of allergens. Certain things, for example, fish and peanut butter that are known allergens or nuts, for example, these should be introduced to an individual in the hospital parking lot prior to a pediatric visit. That way, if you do enter into anaphylactic shock, you are right there in the hospital for the individual to get treated. So typically what they say is the first time that you give them peanut butter should be just at the moment when you're going into the pediatrician's office. And that way, if something is wrong, you have a doctor to be able to help you right there on the spot. You also want to make sure you're introducing food one at a time. If you give more than one different types of food and then you end up with an allergy, you don't necessarily know what they're allergic to. So if you're introducing one food at a time, then you can know what to remove back from the diet when you end up with an abnormal response from the infant. And again, whole milk should not be introduced until the one year mark. Last but not least, obviously you want to limit your choking hazards. I know we spoke about this previously. You want to cut things up like hot dogs and raw carrots, so cut them into small bite-sized pieces. Um, and Infants are not going to be allowed to have honey because honey has a high risk of having um, the botulism, which is the um, bacteria that's going to cause, um, well, it's found in Botox, but it causes nerve damage basically. So you want to make sure that you're avoiding honey and any added seasonings. Infants do not need added salt or added sugar. They don't need added fats. All of that should be coming from their breast milk. So things that are inappropriate for infants are going to include honey, salt, sugar, and fats. Um, so let's talk about food allergies versus food allergens for a minute. So a food allergy is when your immune system has an abnormal reaction to a particular food and causes an immune response. Right now, a food allergen is going to be anything that causes that immune response. So proteins that are not broken down properly by digestion or by pre-cooking um, can cause an adverse reaction in the immune system. And there's two different stages to the reaction. One is a sensitization stage, which is an allergens are going to... Um, Allergens that are introduced can cause a reaction in the immune system, so that's a sensitization stage. And then after that, when the person eats that food allergens for a second and then subsequent times, you can end up with an allergic reaction. So oftentimes you won't get the allergic reaction the very first time that you introduce a food. You might get it the second time that you introduce a food. Um, and so just because an individual was able to consume something once doesn't mean you won't have an allergic response the second time. All right, so this is showing you the reactions to allergens. So say this individual happens to be allergic to strawberries, right? The very first time that they eat strawberries, they're going to come in contact with the strawberry allergen. That strawberry allergen is going to bolster the immune system, which is going to create strawberry-specific antibodies. We didn't have these antibodies before, but now we do. And that means that we're able to then attach to the mast cells and then roam about the body looking for strawberry allergens. Typically, that means you're not going to react to this first allergen because you don't actually even have the antibodies to create the antibody response. But then the next time that you have subsequent allergen contact, like the strawberry allergen, right, you eat it again, now all of a sudden, the antibodies are able to attack those allergens and create histamine, which causes the allergic reaction, causing itching, swelling, nausea, vomiting, et cetera. Um, some of the more severe things include blocked airways, which can occur from swelling, as well as decreased blood pressure, hives, irregular heartbeat. You can also, in infants, have serious problems that occur from vomiting or diarrhea because you can add up a water imbalance. Um, so you want to make sure that you are um, taking great care that if you do have an allergic reaction, you're seeing a, a doctor or a, maybe an emergency healthcare professional. 
Um, and food allergies can happen very quickly. The reactions can occur almost instantaneously within a couple of minutes. Um, and after the food reaches the stomach and starts digestion, you can end up with vomiting or diarrhea. So you might have an immediate reaction like difficulty breathing, but you might have a delayed reaction of vomiting or diarrhea that can occur a little bit later. Um, and so if you do have a problem with this ori original response, you want to make sure that you get to the hospital or to a doctor very quickly so that A, you can offset this breathing difficulty because this is going to be something that is very severe and can cause death in the, in the individual. But you also want to avoid this vomiting and diarrhea response because that's going to cause fluid loss, which can be very, very bad for a small infant. Um, and also, we can end up with a drop in blood pressure, which can also be very bad for the infant. And a way that we can combat these symptoms is something called epinephrine. You may have heard of an EpiPen. If you give someone a shot of epinephrine, it can offset the allergic reaction. Um, however, because infants are so small, this is something that should be administered by a healthcare professional um, because you want to make sure the dosage is correct. So some of the common allergens, things that children can be allergic to, um, eggs, for example, strawberries, peanuts, fish, all of these are very common, chocolate, cow milk. Um, in adults, we can also have reactions to shellfish, peanuts, um, wheat, soy, etc. Oftentimes, children who have sensitivity to certain foods outgrow it. About 80 to 90 percent of your soy allergies and egg, wheat, and um, milk allergies are going to disappear by five years of age. And even things like peanut allergies can be outgrown by approximately 20 percent of the children, although typically parents who have individual or children who have peanut allergies are going to avoid it at all costs and never find out if their child is in that 20 percent. All right, thank you so very much for listening to my lecture today. I really appreciate you coming to class. Aloha and happy studying. Have a great day.